All right. So this is our first um, organ system lecture, the integument. And, and with the integument, primarily what we're going to be looking at is um, the skin. Be the primary thing that we'll be looking at as we go through this. Um, but again, it's our first organ system, uh, and we'll be doing 11 of these throughout AMP1 and AMP2. Uh, and this first one we're looking at is actually the largest organ system in the body. You may not think of your skin, which is, again, the primary part of this organ system as an organ, but your skin is an organ. It plays a very important role, as we'll see, as providing protection and insulation for the body. Um, and so, very significant from that standpoint. And there are two parts, basically, that we're going to be looking at. Again, primarily, we'll focus on the cutaneous membrane, which is the skin, as you know. We talked about membranes last time. Um, but also th accessory structures, things like hair and nails, we'll look a little bit more at glands, to sort of tag on to what we talked about uh, with the histology chapter. So, um, so that's what we'll be looking at as we go through this chapter. Um, the, the cutaneous membrane itself, and you guys know this from our last lecture, uh, consists of two parts, right? It has a, the epithelial part and a connective tissue part. The epithelial is the epidermis, right, above the dermis. And the dermis is the connective tissue part. And um, as you have seen before, the epidermis is stratified squamous epithelium, whereas the dermis is primarily a real or connective. Um, and so we'll, we'll take a look at those things. The accessory structures, which all originate in the dermis, right, extend through to the epidermis, up to the skin surface. So things like hair, nails, glands are all considered accessory structures of this organ system. Now, in this organ system also, we're going to see connections with the cardiovascular system and the nervous system. Um, in your skin, you have blood vessels, right? They're in the dermis. They're housed in the connective tissue. Get very close to the epidermis, but don't work their way all the way up into the epidermis. So that's why we consider the epidermis to be avascular, whereas all the vessels are in the dermis. Uh, also, we're going to see nerve endings, sensory receptors for pain, touch, temperature, just sort of general senses, things like that uh, as well. Beneath the true integument, or excuse me, beneath the true cutaneous membrane of the skin, we have what's called the hypodermis, right? Below the dermis. We also refer to it as the subcutaneous layer or sub Q. Um, and this is more loose connective tissue, primarily adipose tissue. Um, it's where the location for hypodermic injections, and it's, again, it sits below the dermis in terms of location. And so here you can see nicely everything really is sort of a, a section of skin. Uh, the cutaneous membrane itself is the epidermis up here, which is the stratified squamous epithelium. The dermis, which is this middle part, which uh, has two parts actually, a papillary and a reticular layer. And then finally you can see the hypodermis down here, which again is primarily adipose tissue. But you'll see larger vessels that will branch up into the dermis. Right. And that's just sort of a closer look at each section. We'll be looking at each layer, uh, you know, close up and sort of get a feel for what's happening with each component. Um, you can see some other structures like hair shafts and sweat glands, um, things like that uh, in the dermis as well. All right, so what does the skin do for our body? As I said, it plays really an essential role, uh, protection being the primary thing, right? It's your outer surface of uh, the body and protects all underlying tissues and organs. That's why, again, if you have an injury to your skin, it's very important to seal that, not only for, you know, to prevent bleeding, but also to prevent infection from occurring. Um, you want to provide a significant layer of protection. So that's a big function that we'll be looking at. And that's what we looked at when you guys did the histology for stratified squamous epithelium. That was the primary function was protection. Skin can also excrete salts and waste products and water, right, through sweat glands uh, can help maintain body temperature, provide insulation, but also allow for evaporation, right, so we can cool or maintain heat uh, through our skin. And then we'll also look at the production of melanin. Melanin is a blackish brownish pigment that gives our skin and our hair its color. We'll see how that's manufactured in the skin. Um, production of keratin. Keratin is a really important, tough, fibrous protein that's in our skin. It's also in our hair and our nails. 
uh, play a significant role um, in sort of the durability and the strength that we see with these structures. Um, another thing we'll look at that's really important is synthesis of vitamin D. Okay? Your skin, and you may be aware of this, your skin plays a really important role in forming vitamin D for the body um, when it comes in contact with UV radiation through uh, sun exposure. Uh, and so we'll look at how that is formed. Uh, lipids can be stored in the form of adipose tissue, and as we talked about detection of touch, pressure, pain, and temperature, et cetera, through the general sense. So those are a lot of the functions that we're going to be looking at. Uh, and this is a nice slide that just sort of gives you an overview of the cutaneous membrane, its features, epidermis, dermis, and then the excess accessory structures, glands, nails, hair, et cetera. And you can see the functions up there as well. So it's a nice sort of review. All right, so <coughs> the epidermis, as we said, is avascular, right? Stratified squamous epithelium. Nutrients and oxygen diffuse from the capillaries and the dermis up to the upper layer, but the skin itself is avascular. Or not the skin, the top, the epidermis is avascular. So that's an important distinguish, distinction to make because the vessels are actually deeper in the connective tissue, not at the in the epidermis. So uh, stratified squamous epithelium, and you give a nice uh, slide here showing sort of the basic organization of the epidermis and what you're going to be seeing uh, in the in the multiple layers. And that's what we want to look at uh, now is get a feel for the epidermis. And you can see the epidermis uh, has this base of membrane that attaches to the dermis um, and we'll see how that connection is made and how it's enhanced. Now the cells of the epidermis, we've collectively described the tissue as stratified squamous epithelium, but what about those cells that make up the stratified squamous epithelium, well, those are truly referred to as keratinocytes because these cells are essentially dead cells of the free surface that contain large amounts of this protein keratin that we're going to come back to. Uh, these are the most abundant cells in the epidermis uh, and what we see uh, at the skin surface. So uh, your skin is actually considered to be two types. You have either thin or thick skin, depending on um, you know, what we're looking at here. Uh, thin skin covers most of the body and has just four layers of keratinocytes, whereas thick skin is found on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet and has actually five layers. So a little bit different. We'll, in our discussion, when we look at this, we'll just look at thick skin. That way we'll see all the layers. But actually, most of your body uh, is thin skin. Okay, so here's a nice image of thin skin. And then you can see... Um, Thick skin, we'll talk about in a minute. Now, the epidermis or thick skin um, consists of five strata or layers of these keratinocytes, right? And they go from the basement membrane up to the free surface. So, starting at the dermis where it attaches, you have what's called the stratum basal. Then we have the spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, and corium. And so, I want to look at each one of these layers that make up this stratified squamous epithelium and see how these cells differ and what their features are um, as they work their way from the basement membrane to the free surface. And so here's a nice image of uh, thick skin, right? You can see the dermis uh, down here, right? And then it starts with the cells and at the stratum basal, spinosum, granulosum, granulosum, lucidum, and then corneum at the top. So it gives you a nice uh, sort of breakdown of all five different layers uh, of the epidermis. All right, so we'll just take it one layer at a time, again, starting at the basement membrane and working our way up to the free surface. The basement membrane, the first one is, again, this first layer is called the stratum basal. It's attached to this basement membrane, has a strong bond between the epidermis and dermis, as you might guess, right, because you have a nice firm attachment there. Um, and this is basically where we find basal cells or germinative cells or stem cells. These are the cells that look kind of cube-shaped in appearance, but actually are stem cells that are dividing and remain down at the basement membrane and divide cells and cells continue to work their way up the top to the free surface. Now, this connection um, between the epidermis and the dermis, we have two parts. We have what are called epidermal ridge that attach to dermal papillae. And if you go back to the, the image where you see the, the connective tissue coming together with the epidermis, you'll see how that, how that works. And basically, the purpose of having these dermal papillae, which are the mounds and sort of has this sort of undulating line of connection, 
um, is just to increase the, the surface area of the basement membrane and thereby strengthen the attachment between the epidermis and the dermis. Right? Uh, and so that's how they interface with one another. Um, the, and you can see that uh, in this right here, how it goes up and down. And you can also see it um, in this image right here, right? See how it goes up and down. That is the epidermal ridge attaching to the dermal papilla and enhancing the attachment between the two. Now, since those epidermal ridges and dermal papilla are unique to each individual, um, those epidermal ridges actually are the basis of fingerprinting, right? And so fingerprinting, as you know, has gone on to be a very useful tool in terms of, um, you know, criminal justice and, and identifying individuals. Um, and so, so that's very unique, and you can see that in this image here with thick skin. You can see the epidermal ridges that uh, give a unique pattern to each individual. All right, um, so there are some specialized cells like Merkel cells and melanocytes. We'll talk about melanocytes in a little bit. They contain the pigment melanin. Uh, as I said, it gives our skin its color, and so we'll talk about those. All right, so that's the stratum base cell. On top of that, we have the stratum spinosum, which is the spiny layer. Uh, and this layer uh, is basically um, the division of about eight to ten layers of cells from that stratum base cell. So as the stratum base cell is dividing, the cells are going up into this layer called the stratum spinosum. And the cells um, basically continue to divide, and this continues to be uh, increasing the thickness of uh, the layers of the skin. Uh, on top of that, we start to see what's called the stratum granulosum. This is the third layer from the bottom. And this granulosum is very uh, significant. We call it the granule layer because Essentially, the cells stop dividing and start producing these really important proteins. They're keratin and keratohyalin. Keratin is a tough um, fibrous protein. Again, as I said, it's really important. It's part of our, makes up our hair and nails as well as our skin. But also, we have this keratohyalin, which helps cross-link and connect these keratin fibers and gives them sort of an integrated strength uh, between cells. Okay? And so, the stratum granulosum, these cells start producing these protein fibers, keratin and keratohyalin, and essentially the cells dehydrate and die so that when you get to the free surface, you basically have dead keratinized cells. Um, and again, because of the keratohyalin, they create this interlock section of cells uh, that gives them uh, the cells uh, you know, strength and, and resilience. Stratum lucidum. This is the layer that's found only in thick skin. Okay? This, so you will not find stratum lucidum in thin skin. Uh, it's the clear layer. It just sort of sits on top of the stratum granulosum. And then the very top, the fifth layer, is the stratum corneum. This is also referred to as the horn layer. It's your exposed surface of the skin. Typically about 15 to 30 layers of keratinized cells. And again, because these are keratinized and have the keratohyalin, they're water resistant, very strong, tough. Uh, and one thing you may not consider, but you're always constantly getting a new surface of skin. Cells are constantly dividing and being replaced, and so you're losing every few weeks. You're getting a new uh, surface to the skin. So that's what we're seeing in the stratum corneum. And so as I said, this process of keratinization is really important because um, these dead protective cells are filled with keratin and provide uh, a nice layer of protection to the to the body, um, and typically it takes about 15 or 30 days from cell for a cell to move from the bath cell all the way to the corneum at the top. So again, every few weeks or so, you're getting a new um, new layer of skin at the free surface. All right, so that's the that's the layering basically that we're seeing um, with the epidermis. Now there's other components that are important with the epidermis, and that is perspiration, right? We talked about how, back in the first chapter, how it's important for the body to thermoregulate, right? Regulate its body temperature. And we looked at a negative feedback mechanism that if the body temperature gets too high, primary method for trying to cool itself down is sweating, obviously. Uh, and sweating uh, releases water or fluid, and that fluid 
um, heat travels really well with the fluid, and so you cool yourself down. Okay, and so you guys know what that is. But there are actually two types of perspiration we have. What's called insensible perspiration and sensible perspiration. Insensible perspiration is essentially evaporation. Right, it's fluid loss through the stratum corneum just by evaporating, not necessarily by active sweat glands. Whereas sensible perspiration is sort of what we described back in the intro chapter, which is actual water that's excreted by sweat glands. And so you could potentially get dehydration as a result of that, uh, but mostly it's a way to uh, cool the body off. All right. All right, so that's one thing also to look at in terms of function with the skin is uh, perspiration. Now, another thing with the skin that's very significant, obviously, is skin color, right? Not all skin is the same color, of course. Uh, and skin color can be influenced in primarily two ways. One is through pigmentation, where you have an actual pigment that's going into the skin. And the other is blood circulation, vessels, either being more blood flow going closer to the skin or less blood flow going closer to the skin can impact the appearance of your, of your skin. And so we'll look at those two. We'll start with pigmentation. Uh, the first one under pigmentation is keratin. Keratin is an orange yellowish pigment that's found in, in orange vegetables like carrots and squash and peppers and things like that. If you eat enough of these, Carotene that's in these vegetables, you can accumulate this in epidermal cells and fatty tissue, and your skin can take, have sort of an orange hue to that, right? Um, the other is melanin. Melanin is this yellow brown or blackish pigment that's produced actually by melanocytes, right? Melanocytes are in the stratum basal, uh, they're stored in transport vesicles called melanosomes, and the pigment is transferred into the actual keratinocytes, okay? And so this is a really important concept. You can see these melanocytes are typically found in the stratum basal, um, and they produce their melanin, and it goes into the keratinocytes. And so you can see in this image, this looks like um, a melanocyte here, and you can see the melanin pigment going into the actual keratinite, keratinites themselves. Now, what is there a function of melanin, other than giving our skin and our hair color? Um, and that is that actually melanin does provide some protection to our skin from sun damage. Okay? UV radiation, as you guys know, being out in the sun can cause issues with your skin, right? It can cause DNA mutation and burns. These could lead to something as simple as wrinkles and other spots and other types of things in our skin, but also can cause potentially cause skin cancer, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but the activation, right, you guys know when you get out in the sun more, right, your skin oftentimes can become darker as a result of being out in the skin more. Um, and that is because the melanocytes are more active in response to the UV radiation. It's like a protective mechanism, right? And so skin color depends more on melanin production and not necessarily um, the number of melanocytes per se. It's just how active they are. And they become more active when they get sun exposure. And so that more active melanocytes does provide a little bit more protection. Now, another way the skin can get color is through the capillaries that come very close to the epidermis, right? We said our vessels are found in the connective tissue and they go very close to the epidermis. Um, and I, I believe you guys know probably that blood cells, when they're bound to oxygen, right? Oxygenated blood cells can contribute to it's sort of a reddish color. And so, for instance, if you're hot, blood vessels will dilate closer to the skin, and the skin is going to take more of a reddish hue. And the opposite can happen, right? If you're cold outside, your body's more concerned with keeping warmth and keeping blood closer. You might have blood flow decreasing in the skin surface, and the skin will pale somewhat, right? And so, the, the activity of our blood vessels and how much blood is flowing through um, whether closer to the skin or less to the skin surface, can impact skin color. Okay? Um, cyanosis would be sort of an extreme case where you had a bluish skin tint by severe reduction in blood flow or oxygenation or dehydration. Those types of things could cause uh, cyanosis. Now, there are some illnesses that are associated with skin color that you might be familiar with. One that I'm sure most people are familiar with is jaundice, but there are a few other ones that you may not be as familiar with. We can take a look at those. 
Um, so, jaundice is the first thing. Jaundice is the buildup of bile produced by the liver, giving the skin sort of a yellowish or orangish color. And essentially, um, this is a bile is produced. It's a natural process produced by the liver. Helps with the digestion and breakdown of fatty acids, essentially. Um, so it's a very normal process. But if excess bile is being, production, is being produced and not being um, uh, you know, stored properly or dealt with properly, then it could spill over into the epidermal tissue. Uh, and the dangerous, the danger part is with that bilirubin um, that's part of the conversion of the bile. Uh, if you get excess in the blood, it can move in the bloodstream and the brain tissue and be very dangerous to the brain tissue. So, John, this is something that you know newborns can happen as their little sort of digestive systems are still sort of figuring things out. You can get an excess production of bile and uh, potentially have some jaundice. Addison's disease is another one, disease of the adrenal gland resulting in uh, increased production of ACTH and it ultimately leads to excess MSH. MSH is melanocyte stimulating hormone and that gives skin darkening. So that's a, uh, Addison's disease is uh, an example of that. Um, some other skin color illnesses, like a pituitary tumor, right? The pituitary gland <coughs> is responsible for producing um, MSH, that melanocyte stimulating hormone. And if you have a tumor on the pituitary gland, it's potentially you could get excess MSH being released, and that can lead to skin darkening. And vitiligo is just a loss of melanocytes, and it's in essence a loss of color. All right, another really interesting, cool thing the skin does um, for the body is help with vitamin D production. The skin actually can manufacture vitamin D for our body. And this is really important because vitamin D is not something that's easily found in everyday foods. I know there is vitamin D fortified milk and some other, you take a supplement and some other types of things, but um, Vitamin D is essentially the primary way most people get it, if they're not doing those things, is through sun exposure. And so essentially the epidermal cells can produce this vitamin D, or also known as cholecalciferol, in the presence of UV radiation. So for this to work, for your body to manufacture vitamin D for itself, it needs to be exposed to sunlight. And when you're exposed to sunlight in the presence of UV radiation, um, the liver and the kidneys essentially convert that vitamin D that's been manufactured into what's called calcitrol. And calcitrol, as we'll talk about later with the skeletal system, aids in the absorption of calcium and phosphorus. Your bone, two-thirds of your bone is made up of calcium and phosphorus. So you can see that's really important, right? And so insufficient vitamin D, we know, cause, can cause bone issues like rickets, okay? Now, there's a whole other host of studies and other types of things looking at potential implications with ins insufficient vitamin D for the body, from immune system function to nervous system function. So it's something I think we're just sort of the tip of the iceberg in exploring vitamin D. Uh, but it's a very important vitamin, um, and your skin has the ability to manufacture it. And so this is just sort of a nice slide showing how it works, right? Sunlight starts. Um, is, is the key to the whole process and basically forms the color calciferol, uh, which goes to, part of it goes to the liver, which then helps form calcitrol. Calcitrol helps with the um, absorption of uh, calcium and phosphate in the digestive pathway, and therefore you can increase in the strengthening, strengthening and increase the bones. And without that, right, you get sort of a softening of bones. And so rickets, you can see here, is kind of the bowing of the the legs is what can happen with rickets. All right, so vitamin D is really important for the body, and your skin can manufacture that. All right, so another really important um, feature um, of the skin, or not important feature, excuse me, another important thing to know about the skin to look at is skin cancer. It's obviously a, um, something that's very well known. It's the most common form of cancer out there. Cancer in general is the number two cause of mortality. Um, so, this is the one that you're going to see the most of all the different cancer types. Um, and skin cancers essentially are classified based on the type of cell or location 
uh, in the layer of the skin. And so you have what's called basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma in terms of the different types of cancer. Okay? And so this is a nice slide sort of summarizing what we're talking about. You have squamous cell, uh, basal cell, um, which are cells from the epithelial cells that are ultimately turned cancerous. And then a melanoma is when a melanocyte uh, turns cancerous. And so it gives you a nice idea in ovary. So we'll look at some of the features of all these and, and what the, you know, how they progress and their survival rates and other things like that. All right, so the first thing we want to look at is a basal cell carcinoma. This is the most common form of skin cancer, but it also has the highest success rate in terms of cure rates. So if someone has a basal cell carcinoma, chances are if they caught it soon enough, 95% chance they're going to be fine. So that's good news, right? It's the most common type of skin cancer you've seen is also the highest uh, has the highest success rate, um, then that's a good thing. Um, it's found in the stratum germinativum, which also helps the student di discovery of diagnosis, right? If these cells are coming up to the free surface, it's easier to identify them. Um, and typically, it's a small, shiny sort of bump on the head, neck, or arms in terms of a basal cell carcinoma. So that's the significance of basal cell carcinoma. <coughs> Second type is what's called a squamous cell carcinoma. And this is the second most common form of skin cancer. It also has a pretty high cure rate. Okay? Uh, typically, the appearance is a little bit different than this. It's more scaly and red. Um, and again, this one's found in the stratum corneum. Um, and it's more of a, um, you know, found in the lips, but also face, ears, neck in terms of those locations. So, that is a squamous cell carcinoma. And then finally, you have what's called a melanoma. Melanoma is the least common, but it's also the most deadly. So that, you know, again, if we're going to have a, you know, uh, a very challenging and hard to deal with skin cancer, it, at least this is one we see the least. Um, and melanoma, as I said, is found in a melanocyte. And basically, a cancerous melanocyte or skin color cell uh, grows rapidly, but also the danger is that it has the ability to metastasize pretty quickly through the lymphatic system. Um, found on the head, neck, and back, and only a 14% cure rate if it happens to metastasize. If you catch it before it metastasizes uh, or spreads to another part of the body, then I think um, the cure rate is probably higher than 14%, but once it metastasizes, it's pretty dangerous. So, uh, so that is a melanoma. And there's this thing called the ABCD rule that I want to make sure you have a good understanding of. And that is how we can distinguish, determine a melanoma from uh, basal cell or squamous cell carcinomas. And so here are those ABCD rules. Asymmetry, border, color, and diameter. And symmetry means one side looks different than the other, as you can sort of see in this picture. Right, border is that it has an irregular border. It's not very consistent. Color, typically with melanomas, you see more than one color. And the diameter is more than five millimeters. Right, so it's a little bit larger. Um, and so that gives you a nice overview of uh, how you can determine um, if this is a melanoma, which is obviously much more dangerous than the other types of, of skin cancers. Um, all right, so that's uh, um, melanoma. All right, so that pretty much sums up the, finishes up the epidermis. We want to move on then to the dermis. The dermis is the connective tissue part beneath the epidermis that attaches to the epidermis. And as you guys know, this is primarily areolar connective tissue, uh, but it does have some reticular tissue in there as well. Um, and this significance is that it not only is it attached to the epidermis, but it also anchors all those accessory structures, right? We saw blood vessels and hair follicles and sweat glands and other types of things located in the dermis. You're also going to see a variety of cells, uh, as, we, as we talked about, like white blood cells that migrate out of the bloodstream and hang out in the connective tissue. So a lot of significance with the dermis. Uh, and this dermis has two components. The one that is attached to the epidermis is called the papillary layer. And then deeper, you have what's called the reticular layer. Papillary layer, as I said, is areolar connective tissue or real or connected tissue, uh, contains smaller capillaries, lymphatics, and sensory neurons. 
and has these dermal papillae, as we talked about, projecting between these epidermal ridges, and that enhances the attachment between these two by increasing the surface area along that connection. Deeper to that, you have reticular layers. This is more dense, irregular connective. Uh, but you're also going to see a lot of collagen and elastic fibers, and this is really important because the skin's sort of turgor and resilience and bounce that our skin has uh, is due to these fibers, collagen and elastic fibers, right? And so really important, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Now, dermatitis, you've probably heard of, is where you have an inflammation of this deeper, or excuse me, more superficial papillary layer. Uh, it could be infection or irritation or some chemical like poison ivy that can cause this connective tissue to be inflamed and be very uh, uncomfortable. So that's dermatitis. Now, as I said, it's really important that your skin have this strength and elasticity. And most of the strength and elasticity comes in the dermis, right? Because of these two fibers, collagen and elastic fibers. And so these fibers give the skin what we call skin's turgor, or its ability to be flexible and resilient, right? Collagen fibers, as you know, are very strong and provide flexibility. Elastic fibers permit stretching and recoil, um, and they limit the flexibility of these fi fibers to pre prevent damage to the tissue. So those things are all very important in terms of. Uh, keeping the, the dermis very strong. And so, unfortunately, over time, um, we can see damage to the skin, right? Sagging or wrinkles can be caused by dehydration or aging, changes in hormones, UV exposure. All these things can impact the dermis. And the important message is that when you see sagging or wrinkles on the skin surface, it's actually a reflection of what's going on in the dermis, because the dermis is where you have all of the collagen fibers and elastic fibers, and if you have any of those issues, severely a result of what's happening in the connective tissue as opposed to the epidermis. <coughs> now, the epidermis itself will thin. It may not have as many layers, so that could be an impact on the appearance of sagging or wrinkles, but most of that's coming from the dermis um, in terms of that appearance. And so things like stretch marks, wrinkles, um, thickened tissue are, are coming from damage to uh, the dermis. Now, there's also this thing called cleavage lines. Um, cleavage lines are collagen and elastic fibers in the dermis. They're typically arranged in parallel bundles, and the purpose of that is to resist force in a specific direction, so it helps with the strength, the, the, you know, the strength and stability of this dermal tissue. Uh, and so, these cleavage or tension lines establish important patterns. And typically the significance is that if you have a cut that goes along these lines, right, a parallel cut, it's probably going to heal a little easier because fewer fibers have been impacted, whereas cut across, you know, sort of like at a right angle across this tissue will impact more um, fibers and therefore you're going to see a, a greater impact. And so there's a nice shot of that. <coughs> Uh, cleavage lines of the skin. All right, so that's it for the dermis. On to the hypodermis, right? The hypo is the subcutaneous layer, so it's truly not a part of the skin. It's beneath the skin. Um, and it helps just stabilize the skin, allows for separate movement to occur, make, made of um, areolar and adipose tissues, um, and don't see uh, any vital organs in this location, so oftentimes it's site of what we call subcutaneous injections using a hypodermic needle. Um, and it's a good location for that. As I said, most of our fat that we carry in our body is found in this location. This is called subcutaneous fat or sub-Q fat or subcutaneous adipose tissue. Um, and this is what is reduced in what we call liposuction, which will remove some of that uh, adipose tissue. All right? uh, and there you can see the adipocytes, and you guys have seen adipose tissue already in, uh, under the microscope and the histology chapter, we talked about that. And this is where an abundance of that adipose tissue is located. All right, so that's the primary portion of the um, integument, is the uh, skin. And we talked about the epidermis, the dermis, the hypodermis, and all the different features and functions. And now we can start to look a little bit at the accessory structures. Accessory structures, we're going to look at the hair, 
uh, and the nails and the glands. And I'm not going to focus on these quite as much, but there are a few things you want to make sure you have a good understanding of uh, with these accessory structures. Okay? Uh, so as I said, hair, hair follicles, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, nails, all are integumentary accessory structures. They're located in the dermis and project through the skin surface. So really important from that standpoint. We'll do hair first. The human body is covered with hair pretty much all over, except like your hands and feet, bottom of your feet, essentially. Uh, and the function of hair is really just to protect and insulate, right? Uh, guards openings, uh, these hair endings are attached to nerve endings. Uh, so they are sensitive to very light touch, but the hair itself is a dead structure. So like when you get a haircut, obviously, you don't notice that. But if someone yanks the hair out of your head, you'll notice that, right? Because it's attached to a, to a nerve ending. Okay? So the hair follicle, then, is located deep in the dermis, wrapped by a connected tissue sheath, um, and basically ha has what's called an erector pili muscle attached to it, which is involuntary smooth muscle. This is why our hair can stand up on end times, like when we produce goosebumps, like if you're uh, cold or nervous or excited about something, you might get goosebumps. That's because of those erector pili muscles. Uh, some other accessory structures of the hair are sebaceous glands. We talked a little bit about these. Se sebaceous glands produce sebum. Sebum is, sebum is an oil-based secretion that lubricates the hair and also controls the movement of bacteria. It tries to limit the movement of, of bacteria into our body. So, um, the regions of the hair, you have a hair root and a hair shaft that, as you can see in this image, um, you can see the, the hair root and the connective tissue. You can see the erector pili muscle attached to that base, and you can see the hair moving up all the way up to the um, free surface. You can see the sebaceous gland, which is going to produce sebum. It's also going to go onto the hair shaft itself as well. The hair structure is basically made of different types of ke keratin. You have soft keratin and hard keratin. Um, in the medulla, it's core is soft keratin. The, the cortex contains hard keratin. And then the follicle structure uh, is sort of a connective tissue sheath um, that, that uh, roots the hair deep in the dermis. And there's a nice histological section of that uh, in that location. And there you can see some deep some, some images of the cuticle and the cortex in those structures. So hair production begins deep in the hair follicle and divides just like our skin does pushes hair up and out of, out of the skin, onto the skin surface, made by a dot dividing layers of cells. And as we talked about, I've already talked about the medulla cortex and the cuticle. Uh, and again, keratin is the primary structure. It's keratinized. It has the soft and hard keratin that it's made of. Um, and these different layers, as you can see, I, I wouldn't be as concerned about that. Most I want you to know sort of what it's made of. Um, and don't worry about the hair growth cycle um, as much. What I do want you to know is the different types of hair. Actually, all hair is not the same in the body. Uh, you have what's called lanugo hair, vellus hair, and then terminal hair. Lanugo hair is actually hair that is embryonic hair that's actually shed before birth, so you don't really ever see that. So that's lost before birth. So the two primary types we have as we grow up and then become adults is vellus hair first, and then terminal hair. Ve vellus hair is very soft, fine hair that covers the body's surface, right? You can see it all over. I sort of refer to that as like a peach fuzz. Um, very soft, fine, non-pigmented. Uh, and those oftentimes give way to terminal hairs, um, which are much thicker, coarser, pigmented hairs on your head, your eyebrows, eyelashes. Uh, pubic hairs, things like that, are all considered to be terminal hairs. So you have the nugo, vellus, and terminal. So make sure you have an understanding of those three different types of hairs. Hair color, just like our skin, is produced by melanocytes. Melanocytes, um, you know, what color is produced is determined by genes. Melanocytes produce the melanin, it goes into the hair, and that gives our hair its color. And so as we age, Right? Gray hair, as we all associate with older individuals, is really just a lack of melanocyte activity, right? We learn melanocytes become less active as we get older, and so you lose that color, right? 
as a result of the lack of melanocytes. All right, so that's hair. Next accessory structure we want to look at are glands, right? And the two types of glands we want to look at are sebaceous glands and sweat glands. That's what we're going to focus on. Sebaceous glands, as you guys know, as I already said, are oil-based glands. They produce sebum, which oils the skin. They're made of uh, holocrine-type glands that produce sebum, where the entire cell is shed. We talked about those back in the biology chapter. Um, and sweat glands are actually two types. You have apocrine sweat glands, which as you know, the apical portion of the cell is shed. And then you have merocrine sweat glands, which we also talked about, are just water secretions where the cell remains completely intact. So we're representing all three of the different types of mode of um, glandular cells that we looked at in the previous chapter here uh, in the integument. So first we'll look at sebaceous glands. Again, these are oil-based glands, typically simple branched alveolar glands, um, and they produce sebum, right? Sebum uh, is discharged onto the skin surface. Again, it's sort of uh, uh, lubricating, make the skin, try to give the skin some moisture, but it also can slow bacteria movement, so it does provide some protection uh, as well. Okay. And so you have a sebaceous follicle that's associated with the skin, you have a sebaceous gland that's associated with the hair. So basically the same thing. One is associated with the skin. One is associated with the hair. Right? So your skin can get oily, right? If you don't, you know, you know like camping some weekend or for a week or something like that and weren't able to bathe that much, right? Your skin might be a little bit oily. Your hair might be a little bit oily. And that's from these sebaceous glands on the hair and sebaceous follicles uh, on the skin. Basically, they're both doing the same thing. Um, and you can see those structures. All right, so those are sebaceous glands, producing sebum, that oil-based secretion. Um, next, we want to look at sweat glands. Two types of sweat glands, basically the ones that make a stink and the ones that don't make a stink. The ones that make a stink are called apocrine sweat glands, right? These are the ones found in armpits or in the groin, right? And they produce sort of a sticky, cloudy secretion that when they break down, come in contact with bacteria, they produce odors, right? And so these apocrine sweat glands are the ones that make us stink. These are not, you know, entirely all over our body. Again, they're only in certain locations. The ones that are pretty much all over our body are American sweat glands, right? We talked about these back in the histology chapter. American sweat glands are sweat glands that are widely distributed all over the body's surface. They're coral tubular glands, and they produce primarily just water directly discharge onto the skin surface, and it's how your body primarily cools itself off through these American sweat glands, right? Sensible perspiration is achieved by the activity of these American sweat glands. So basically what's secreted is water, but also can lose salt, waste products, and so a nice sweat can actually be healthy for you as you can lose a lot of waste products in sweating. Um, so these American sweat glands, again, cooling the skin, that's a big function of them but they can also excrete water and electrolytes, flush microorganisms and harmful chemicals from the skin, so they, they really provide a multifaceted purpose. And so those are American sweat glands. So make sure you understand the difference between, you know, the two different types of sweat glands. Uh, some other integumentary glands that we talk about, uh, mammary glands, we talked about those already uh, back in the previous chapter. Um, ceruminous glands we have not talked about yet. These produce cerumen. Cerumen R is earwax, sort of a sticky substance, as you guys know, helps protect, protect the eardrum again, slow pathogen movement and protect that, that ear ear. Now, glands are controlled by the autonomic nervous system, right? Sebaceous and apocrine sweat glands um, are controlled by the autonomic nervous system. American sweat gland is controlled independently, um, so that sweating occurs locally. And again, the main function is for thermoregulation, right, to help regulate body temperature. Nails, um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on nails. Basically, the function is to help protect our fingers and toes. You think about this nice, firm structure we have in our fingernails and toenails. As pressure is put on our fingers and toes on the other side, it gives a nice sort of backboard of, of uh, support, basically, um, and provides uh, protection as those structures are oftentimes 
distorted, right? With pressure of her hands handling things and her toes and walking and running, things like that. Um, so why don't you just sort of review through the, the structures of the nail, um, but there's not a whole lot to it in terms of uh, material. All right, so sort of in the home stretch here, last 10 slides or so, so I want to look at um, a few concepts. First, I want to look at repair of the entanglement, uh, how, this, how the skin is repaired when it's injured. Um, then we want to look at uh, burns, what happens when you have an injury of burn. And then we'll look at some impact of aging um, on the integument as well. First thing is repair of the integument. As we know, skin can regenerate effectively because stem cell. You already have the stem cell division system in place. So if you damage the skin, right, these cells are just starting to divide and we'll replace what's lost. Um, but the size of the injury can affect how quickly it heals, right? The more skin damage, the longer it's going to take to repair, of course. And so there are four steps or stages of uh, skin regeneration that we see. First thing is inflammation. And basically, I just want you to have a snapshot understanding of each of these four phases. Things that's happening um, in inflammation primarily is bleeding, right? We see bleeding that occurs because if the injury goes deep enough into the dermis, you know, impacts and vessels, uh, and mast cells and inflammation will respond. So bleeding and inflammation are happening in this first phase. Next is what we call the migratory phase, right? Epithelial cells begin to migrate along the that side of that wound. Scab also forms, as you know, through a positive feedback loop, which enhances the clotting mechanism that occurs. Um, and so migratory phase uh, occurs next. Um, after that, we have proliferation, where we see a lot of fibroblasts and sort of reworking of the connective tissue. The scab is starting to be undermined uh, in that location. And then finally, we have what's called a scarring phase, where the fibroblasts lay down a lot of um, fibers, collagen fibers, and so you may have a higher you know, incidence of fibrous tissue in that connective tissue, and the result might be a scar at the top. Again, that's a result of what's happening in the dermis, not as a result of what's going on in the epidermis, right? The dermis is where that scarring is occurring, all right? So those are the four phases, so make sure you have an understanding of those four uh, and how they, uh, you know, snapshot of what's going on with each one of those. Now, burns is another really important thing to understand, is that burns can be very dangerous for the body, of course, obviously, as well. Um, and you've probably heard of a first degree, second degree, third degree burn. You know exactly what that means. And it really just refers, of course, to the severity and how deep the burn went, right? So you have first degree, second degree, third degree. First degree is impacting only the epidermis. So a sunburn, a pretty good sunburn, that's a first degree burn. Um, if you're a burn of some kind that impacts the epidermis and goes into the dermis a little bit, that's second degree, and obviously the most dangerous is a third degree burn because you're losing the epidermis, dermis, and then even some of the subcutaneous. So that is the most dangerous um, and because burns that third degree burns that cover more than 20% of the skin surface can be dangerous just to life. Right? You may not be able to hold fluids as easily. Right? You might be losing fluids and electrolytes, which can impact um, the electrical activity of your your heart and your body. Uh, maintaining body temperature can be impacted, and then again, just protecting itself from um, pathogens and other types of things. So if you get to that 20% range, it's pretty significant. And so there's this thing called the rule of nines that I want you to know that estimates the percentage of surface area impacted by a burn. And so it's, it's a nice little tool to have, actually, so you can sort of get a feel for what percentage of the integument is dedicated to what part of the body. So for instance, uh, the head, and you just need to worry about the adult for now, um, the head is 9% of the skin surface, right? Each arm is another 9%. The trunk is 36, front and back of the trunk is 36%. And then each lower leg, or each leg, is 18% um, each. So, you know, if you have just one leg that's really badly burned, right, you're pretty much right at the threshold of, of, of serious danger uh, to your system and survival. So, um, <clears throat> so so make sure you have a good just sort of snapshot. Again, that's just general good information to have. 
uh, understanding how much of the entanglement is dedicated to what's, you know, what's part of the body. All right, last thing I want to look at here is just the effects of aging on the entanglement. And essentially, the, the bottom line with this impact of aging with the epidermis is really is that cell division slows as we age. We talked a little bit about that last time, but basically um, the cell division that we have in place of the epidermis slows. Metabolism across the board slows. We don't have as many cells. So the epidermis, as I said earlier, is thinner typically in older individuals, right? You don't have as many, the cell division rate is not as high, and so you just have fewer cells, so therefore you have a thinner epidermis, which can mean slower repair. You may not be able to produce as much vitamin D for yourself. Um, you're not going to see as many mel melanocytes. Melanocytes can be less, less active. So as I said before, that gives you gray hair and pale skin. But again, that vitamin, uh, excuse me, that, that um, melanocyte activity helps protect our skin a little bit, so you might not be able to uh, tolerate being in the sun for a very long time. Your glands are less active, right? And so it's talking about sweat glands and sebaceous glands, right? You may not be able to cool down as easily, right? Because your sweat glands may not be as active. Your skin may be drier as we get older because uh, the sebaceous glands aren't as active, right? Not producing that sebum, that lipid for the skin. Uh, blood supply is a little bit less. You have slower healing. Again, also you know, leading to an ability to overheat. Um, the dermis itself, as we talked about, as we get older, sagging and wrinkling can occur because the dermis just does not have as many fibers, right? Not as many collagen and elastic fibers. And so, as a result, you lose some of that elasticity and resilience and bounce to your skin as we age. Uh, fewer hair follicles, changes in distribution and the location of the fat in hair can also be uh, significant, all right? Um, all right, so that is it for this lecture, um, and that wraps up for this unit. So you have the intro chapter, the histology chapter, and the integument, and then we'll have our, our first exam, first lecture exam of this material coming up. So um, that's it for now.